You're welcome along to the Locker Room Podcast. I'm here with Ross Bennis, Head of Performance at Queen's Park Rangers Academy, and Joe Coulter, Head of, Oper- Head of Operations, Joe, with, with Daily Sports Science, amongst many other things, it must be said. We said that we have to get the three musketeers back together again. Joe was feeling left out, Ross. He wasn't invited on to the S&C one with Rich Clark. So we said, let's do a podcast just so that we can get Joe back in. Yeah, it's been fantastic, hasn't it? The last few um, podcasts, not because Joe wasn't there for a couple of them, of course, but <laughs> it's, we've had some really good uh, guests on and some big names. But, you know, I really look forward to this and getting back to chatting amongst the three of us like our first one. So, Joe, welcome back. There's probably going to be um, an uproar on Twitter that you wasn't on a couple again. So there's, there's hopefully we've given the people what they want early enough and, and you're back on today. <laughs> Yeah, it's great to be back, Ross. You know, there's lots of complaints going about there on Twitter about me not, not being on these sports science ones, you know. Um, so uh, it's great to be back here with, with the two legends. Joe, they, they were predominantly from your brother, Benny, and, and your family and clubmates in Mayo Bridge. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a small confined area there, Kieran. Yeah. It no, is not just outside of Mayo Bridge. Yeah, just remember, please, that this is a trial. To get you back in is a trial basis only. Okay, so just keep that in mind in your answers as well. Okay, so let's get on to it. First of all, uh, make sure anybody who's listening, thanks very much for your support. We're hitting uh, nearly a thousand listens and downloads per week at the moment or per episode, which has been really overwhelming and and brilliant. Uh, The response to, I think, especially Chris Ramsey's episode and to Bernard Jackman's episodes has been top class, um, along with all the others, in fairness, with the journalists and Rich Clark. So we want to keep it going. We keep the content good. Um, anybody who's not signed up to the website, go on over dailysportscience.com and we're offering 20% off membership at the moment. And lads, there's there's so much content going up there every day, isn't there, at the moment on the WhatsApp group and on the website? Yeah, there is. There's there's lots of stuff up there here now. There's lots of new practices up uh, from from tactical pads, lots of new phases of play <clears throat> and scoring, scoring combinations. So yeah, so ha- have a look there and, and adapt as, as you please. Yeah, exactly. Brilliant. Okay, so what we're going to do today, we're going to have a little bit of a discussion between the three of us. I think it'll be an interesting one. So recently, I did a presentation for the GA webinar series, which was great. And what I did was I looked back with a case study on London GA. So our involvement with London GA, uh, where I was manager, Joe was assistant manager, and Ross was head of performance. Um, and we were there for, for four years, more or less, in, in total. And I called the presentation Preparing David to Face Goliath, a case study. And what I said at the beginning was, this isn't, this isn't any secret to how to win in All-Ireland or win a competition. It's not a sports science presentation it's not this is exactly what you should do with your team it was more about okay this is a case study of what we did and then you can adapt those things to your team or to your club the principles let's say um the main thing that i did was looked into uh, uh, look back over the six-step model of development with looking to long term making sure plan and organization is top class bringing in really good support staff having an innovative sports science team, individualized coaching, and then, as I call it, brutal reflection back on yourself in order to improve, an open, open environment to try and improve everybody. Uh, what we'll do is, in part two of this, we'll dig deep into, Ross, into the sports science innovation and the individualized coaching um, the next day. And just before that, then we'll go through the stuff, the other stuff then that I mentioned before that part two. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I think it's a good uh, opportunity to go through the, uh, the presentation in a little bit more detail in part A and part B and, and give listeners a real insight to what the real specifics that we did and reflections on, on that four-year period. So, yeah, it was great work here. It's great to have that down and document kind of the journey that you personally had and, and we had along with you um, and great to discuss it today. Yeah, it, I actually have to say it was quite enjoyable. It was quite an enjoyable experience to reflect back on all that time and to like i'm really happy as i said to get it in a document and get an audio of it and it kind of feels like it's a little bit of a a history of our time with the team which is quite cool to to have done i remember speaking to an irish guy who works with eis ross and he was saying that you know that's a really cool project that you lads did there you took a team 
an under-resourced team, not as talented as some of the other teams you had to come up against, and how you built that whole setup in order to compete. And I always thought that was quite an interesting way of thinking of it. I was like, that was a project you took on. Yeah, massive projects. And also the fact that we had so much, um, I wouldn't say control, but influence over the whole program, the way that we work together. And, and that will come out amongst us. Um, there's not many people, unless you're going in first team managers or managers at inter-county level, that have a real control and influence over that journey from all the aspects of the program, not just the coaching, the sports science, the operations, etc. So that would be really good to discuss today with, with you two. Yeah, I think that's an interesting one. And we might jump into that on the long term and the planning and everything like that, because it's a really important one. I hope our Wi-Fi quality will, will keep going during this COVID time. It might get a little dodgy coming in and out, but hopefully it'll be fine. In general, lads, first question, Joe, Joe and then on to Ross. And you can, you can take over, Ross, from Joe. How do, you look, how do you feel about that period in general? Like, How do you look back on that period working with London? And, and is it... Is it a, was it a positive experience? Was it a negative? Was there good and bad? Or how do you feel now, thinking back? Um, well, Kieran, it was overall, it was a massively positive experience uh, for me. And uh, if, if you can just remember back, I actually came in the second year, and I think you and Ross were already there, so you guys were there for a year already. So when, when I came in, I was already coming into to a kind of culture that is already set up. Yeah, so I think you boys had it set up in, in one year. Well, coming into a professional setup, and I'd never experienced anything like this, and certainly in sports teams uh, that I had managed or that, that I had coached. I coached you know, intermediate teams, university teams, uh, London, London Junior Gaelic team. But when I came into that setup, uh, it, was, it was massively professional. You know, everything, everything was there. The most important thing that I seen was the long-term planning. Uh, because when I was with other teams, you were only planning from maybe day to day or week to week. There, there was no monthly planning. There was no kind of six monthly or season planning. There was no, because you knew what you were doing maybe in six months time, you could plan towards that. So that, that was one of the, the things that kind of hit me, hit me first about it. Um, and also the, the kind of integration with the sports science. Uh, I can remember... Uh, being the kind of player with, with set previous London setups on, and there were sports scientists so there were strength and conditioning coaches but they were just a bolt-on they were just an add-on it weren't really integrated into the whole aspect of the team or the culture and everything like that so so that was kind of uh, uh, different for me and yeah overall here and you know it, it, it takes over your life actually too you know from a personal point of view and you know the, the amount of hours you do you know and the amount of text messages you get and phone calls from yourself <laughs> <laughs> True. Tr trying to get things, trying to get things done, <clears throat> and you know it's 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 all pushed by yourself and and Ross there, and um, you know it's I I've said you know I probably learnt more in the first year in London, in that London setup than I did in my kind of previous ten years coaching and managing other fo football teams. So it was a very very steep uh, learning curve for me, um, and it, I was kind of thrown in at the deep end, you know. Did so so yeah. And Joe, on that, I mean, how, how did you find that, I suppose, step up to a higher level of stuff? Or like, I'm just interested because there would have been some coaches, club coaches, who would come into that and their reaction is, well, why the hell are you doing all that monitoring and planning and sports science? And it's just about get the ball, score, get a team working together. Don't worry about all that stuff. And, and the kind of things that you're doing to bring in the sports science and everything like that is a bit of a waste of time. How did you find that kind of step up into it? Or, or was that something you were actually looking to embrace and looking for? Yeah, well, well that was something that I was looking for, Kieran. And ge generally, I be, tend to be open to learning. You know, it's probably my education, teaching background. Yeah. Um, but, but I always kind of wanted to know, uh, was, I, was I doing it right with my club? What, was I doing it right? You know, and uh, I think when I went to uh, one of the coaching uh, sessions that you don't think was level one coaching session I kind of when, when I met you I was kind of saying I agreed a lot with you you know we kind of the same philosophy or outlook on, on football and I was thinking yeah well you know I think I'm doing it right here and it'd be good to you know make the step up so I was kind of open to to all of, all of the stuff that, that was coming in the sports science and the psychology the IAPs just just the nutrition 
everything, I, I was open to it, you know, because if you don't try these things, if you don't experiment with them, then, you know, you're going to be closed minded. You're going to be closed minded and everything, and you're not going to be trying new things. Yeah. And, if you, and if they don't work, you know, so, so what? Just learn from it and, and kind of move on to the next thing. Yeah, That's the I think, way I thought. Yeah, and I think we, we'll touch on some of those things actually about buy-in and, and agreeing with the manager or disagreeing and stuff like that on the support staff. I think that's a really interesting point. Like the one thing I would say about you, Joe, I remember was like the passion for GA and, and, and football and to be involved. Like we always roomed together on away games back in Ireland, back in Dublin and everything like that. And like we used to have great crack listening to the GA or Woody Parkinson and talking about what was going on at Congress. And like there was an interest there at all stages and, and not just in the game or the coaching or the playing or the news. It was like everything about the rule changes, about everything. And I really enjoyed that. And I thought we kind of quite bounced off each other really well, a similar type of kind of personality, I think. Yeah, I agree with that. I actually thought you were going to mention the late night pints that we had down. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dude, we can't you know, mention them. No, 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 no. Sure no. Um, on on uh, the county chairman's credit card, was it? <laughs> 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 no wonder we got the sack. Jeez. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I think, you know, it's good to meet people that are in the same sort of wavelength as you, you know, because they understand you more and you can bounce ideas off them and you can kind of read, read them more. You know, and, and it's, it's good to have coaches in there as well that are kind of a different mindset as well because you, you can learn more from those. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, so that was good. And, was, you know, it goes back to your, to your roots, I suppose. It goes back to your mm. club, my club, Mayo Bridge. When, when I was with Mayo Bridge, um, I think we, we won eight senior championship medals. So we were a team that was on the up and we had lots of good players and lots of good forwards, you know, so... So I was, you know, always wanted to kind of get into the coaching side of things. Yeah. We never won an Ulster. We never won an Ulster Championship with Mayo Bridge. And that was one of the things that was very disappointing considering the type of players we had. And, and I thought one of the reasons why we didn't win an Ulster, Kieran, was be, because of our tactics, mm, things like that, and, and the kind of setup and things like that. We yeah, did have players, but we didn't have this kind of setup, if you like. Yeah. And it, 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 it definitely could be said, Joe, that you won those eight titles due to the Coulter household. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we won't say who in the Coulter household, but it was because of the Coulter household. <laughs> Ross, in general, just jumping back then to the original question, how do you look back on that time with London? Yeah, I look back with um, huge reflection and, and it's great to talk about it. Listen, overall, it's very positive. Um, I loved it. I love working with you guys. I think that comes across now on how well like, we get on personally as well as professionally. And it makes a big difference. It's, it's not often that you really click with people, not just in terms of personally and how you are, but also in your thought process, you know, what you think about players, what you think about training, what you think about the whole setup. It's not often that you really agree on, on the vast majority of, of how you're setting things up. And that I think that's what transferred into this programme really well. Um, I look back with mixed emotions, though. I think, first of all, like, I never knew any different. I, I didn't know Gaelic at all. And Kieran rang me and said, um, do you want to come and work for Gaelic football? I, I didn't even know it existed, Joe. Um, <laughs> I had to go and Google a few clubs and stuff and found out in London it's actually quite big. But listen, I turned up. Kieran was actually in India, so I actually ran yeah, the team true. for the first two months, if you think that's about true. it, Kiz. Um, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, hey, Brian McBearty would have words about that. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, was, I was at the track. He was there with me in all fairness. The two of you, no, in fair, and listen, I said that, sorry to cut across. I did say that the other night that on the webinar that yourself and Brian, you know, McBearty did run the setup, you know, along with Noel Dunning and Paddy Curtin or whatever. For sure. The two of you did. And it was an interesting time, wasn't it? It's very interesting. I mean, we did a little bit of track work and look, I've gone into this group of lads and trying to take this professional approach from what I knew in my day job into, into an amateur sport. But I could yeah. not believe how receptive the players were and how, how hard working they were and how they wanted so many things and to improve. And, you know, they were great to work with over the four years. We worked with some fantastic yeah. lads. Um, yeah. But I have to say, as much as it was positive over that period, I was also a little bit gutted that we, I don't think we reaped the rewards that we should have um, in terms of victories, in terms of league standings, in terms of championship wins. Um, I think you know, what we all did as a collective deserved a bit more. So mixed emotions, but took huge things from it and, and was very grateful for, for, for bringing me in. 
Yeah, like actually, look, there's loads there you could chat about. First of all, it was quite interesting. Like I was in India in a hotel in in Mumbai chatting to Nicholas and Elka and, and Terry Phelan sitting down having dinner. And then I'd get back to my room and I'd be like texting Kahlo Green in North London and, and you know, the, the, <laughs> the different lads like trying to get them in back in to play with London and stuff like that. So that was a different experience. But yeah, that, that, those points resonate with me, Ross, where overall a very positive experience and very enjoyable. Like by my, my wife would say to me that I, I never complained about going to London training. Like if it was absolutely freezing cold, if it was lashing raining, if it was a Sunday morning, if it was whatever, I enjoyed going. You know, I looked forward to actually hopping on the train or hopping into the car and I, I loved the coach and I'm meeting the lads and everything like that. And you can't say that about every position or job that you've had. Um, but if I think back over the whole period, me as a manager, I like it was a failure, you know, because we didn't win a championship game. We didn't win a qualifier or whatever. So you'd have to say that, well, overall it was a failure. Now there, are, you can challenge that and say, well, what is success? you know, bringing a team from here to there on a journey, building a culture, building a setup and everything like that, but just purely in terms of results and everything, you know, you say, well, that was a failure. I agree with you in that I, f I, f I think we should have won a few games. There was a few more games we should have won, championship, should have done better in the league, whatever, and that's definitely a regret, you know, thinking back to that. Um, like you, bit gutted by the end as well, you know, not to kind of, I suppose, have the chance to, one more chance to kind of bring it on to another level, you know, and, and everything like that. But overall, definitely very positive experience. And I think I probably learned the most from that in my career than any, anywhere else, you know, bar, I think bar the first six months of when I came into Queen's Park Rangers Academy and it was like, whoa, this is professional football and full time and just different than what I experienced before working in the GA, you know, where players aren't full time. Um, I think I learned, learned a huge amount. It's interesting then, and Ross, maybe we, we'll, we'll touch on this. So the first step that we spoke about previously in the webinar was taking that long-term approach. So to the development, so trying to actually bed in new things about culture and our values and, you know, about our mission, what our mission was and all. I know you coming from like a professional football, soccer background, things aren't very, in adult, aren't very long-term. It's very results-based uh, sport and you have to win on that Saturday. And if you don't win, you get the sack. How did you find coming into the GA then in terms of with London where we had a little bit more space to actually look towards the future? Do you think that we got it right in how we did it? Was it the correct thing to do? Try to bed down culture, or should we be gone? Do you know what? I don't care about that. Let's just go put all our eggs in the basket. We have to win more games. Interesting, kids. I mean, you got to remember, I come from like a 12, 13 years in academy football. Yeah. So, like, it's a little bit different for us on day to day. We're not, we're not fighting Saturday, 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 and we've got a bit more time to develop players. So, I think it was, it was what we always knew um, in terms of bedding down a culture, looking for a long term plan. I think we got it right in the sense that we, we, you can't go and take a program and implement it in year one. So we had to make sure that over time that we improved things over time and kept improving things. And that, that's also about professionalism, standards, culture. But also we had to keep going back a little bit because we had so many new players coming into the panel. So you'd build a great um, program and a great culture by the end of year one, end of year two. But then start pre-season again, you've got half the squad gone and a new half of the squad. So you always have to revisit things. Um, and, and that was that was tricky, but it was a constant reminder of what we stood for and what we wanted to uh, to embed into our values. I think that maybe long term, it's, it's good in the terms of the GA, you had like terms, so you knew you was going to be there for a one year or two year or yeah. whatever it was. So it gives you a bit of security, but maybe just on the flip side of that, and we talk about the results business, maybe if there was a little bit more... Um, let's say tipping scale towards the results for that season or the league mm. campaign and, and we compromised a little bit on something on the long-term vision it may be weird to go over the line a little bit more but that's 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 a philosophical question really so. yeah it's a really interesting point because actually i do remember where two of our best players 
were away on holidays and for the next game I didn't start either of them in that first year it was our second league game and I didn't start either the uh, Liam Gavigan and Mark Ocha. and because I felt that well I want to set up a culture here in that you don't just come back straight into the team you do your time you play half the game on the bench and then you introduce them in the second half and like we lost that game against Carlo by two points now if you play two of your best players for the whole duration of the game, you win that match, you know, and then who knows where the season goes after that. So there's a tricky situation there between results and, and, and long term, I think. Um, Joe, Joe, I know you're big on culture and environment and everything like that, and that was something that we really did put a lot of time into. We had Bernard Jackman on the podcast a few weeks ago, and he gave us some really interesting tips and everything like that. How important did you feel creating the right environment and culture in, in, in London was? Um, yeah, it was, it was really, really important, Kieran. And just going back to Ross's point, one of the main reasons why it was important to have a strong culture uh, was because your turnover of players was very high. I think you're talking around maybe 50% of players. If you're bringing in 15 every year for a panel of 30 or so, you know, that, that's a big turnover. And that means those players have to come into a culture that already exists ra- rather than kind of, yes, they come in and you teach them up to the culture and, you know, you set an example to them, uh, but they're already coming into the culture. So, so the players are the, that already are there, the established players, will be telling those players, listen, you don't, you don't do that. You don't arrive to train and five minutes late. You know, you can't do that. You know, um, you can't eat this, you can't eat that. This, this is not how we do these things around here. So from that point of view, I think culture in London is perhaps more important than, than other uh, counties back in Ireland. Um, the one thing also that I would say about culture is w- when you're bringing in a player, and we've done it many times, Kieran, bringing in a, a kind of average, maybe fourth, second division club player back home, and you're bringing them in to, to, a, to a good culture like we created in London, um, that player, on many occasions, has become a really good county player. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, the, and we know many here, without naming names or anything, and, and lots of players have done that because they thrive in the culture. So it just kind of goes to show you, given, given the right culture, you know, given the right environment, um, given the right support team, support mechanisms that were all in place, you know, a, a player that is, is kind of average can become a good county player. You know, in, in consideration of them having a really good attitude, which yeah. as Ross said, him coming from that kind of football background, soccer background, uh, a lot of the Gaelic boys do, did have brilliant attitudes and a lot of the London lads have brilliant attitudes. So, so it all meant that, you know, that, you know, most of them could thrive in that. So, so from that point of view, culture was massively important. Yeah, do you know, it's, it's interesting because the, getting the opportunity is so important, you know, just being put in that situation and then obviously it's up to you to, to, to grasp that chance then, you know. I think if it was me, if it was a slightly different situation, I'm thinking as regards club coaches here who are listening or county coaches or whatever, if I had the chance to kind of invest in the youth, in the coming group of players over a number of years, that's what I'd do. I, I, I'd put my effort massively into those young guys coming through. Now, I wouldn't get rid of the older guy because A, like, you know, you need them. You need them to build a team. But B, they can be a very disruptive influence if, if, you, if, if you don't treat them well, they can become very disruptive. So you, not, you need a nice blend between the kind of young and the older. But over time then, you phase the older guys out. So you, you put your effort into the young lads. You make sure they're open to learning, coachable, reflective, uh, like Ross even, make sure they're really fit, they're athletic, they learn things, they're open to it, they improve on their fitness, they get used to like um, the sports science monitoring and the fitness testing and everything like that. And, then, and, and also, of course, you bed down a really good system of play and tactics and improve them as footballers. So to me, the lo- slightly longer term approach actually can work. Yeah, is I think you got it spot on in terms of the way you went about that group. But what essentially we had to do is we had to build a long-term plan just for the senior team. Like we didn't have much 
up and coming players from from the youth. There wasn't much of a youth set up as we know yeah. it, you know, in, in freshman football and freshman soccer, them coming yeah. through, you know, 10, 20 players per age group. So it, we were hard and we had some really good London born players that came through the, the London type club system and the London setup, let's say. Um, but we was planning long term for that one group. And it's a slightly different thing because you're bringing in a player who's 18, 19, who's completely raw. So within one or two years time, you have to make them ready for senior football or, or there's no long term planning for that player. They, yeah. They've got they've got to go and they've got to do it within a year. So their yeah. journey is one year. It's not an eight year process of long term, you know, development and stuff. So it is yeah. slightly different. And I think your vision was more long term vision for London as a inter county senior football team. It, yeah. And we didn't really trickle into the, the, the setup of the youth that we would have liked to, let's say. No, it wasn't possible. Yeah. Do you know just quickly before we move on to the kind of planning and organizing briefly, I was on a call previously another day and uh, Fionn Fitzgerald, uh, ex Kerry player, and Keen uh, Gormley, who, who has worked with Leinster GA, or, sorry, Leinster Rugby and Dublin GA, and we were speaking all about environment and everything like that. And they did make a couple of good points whereby, like, setting a culture and environment is great and everything like that, but it all depends on whether the manager and the coaches and the staff still promote that kind of open environment and questioning and reflection when things start going badly. So when you start losing and the pressure hits, like, and it's true, isn't it? How many setups are like all open and it's wonderful and great, but then you start losing a few games and it's like, right, we're doing it my way. I don't give a shit what you think. I don't, I'm not yeah. getting feedback. I'm going to blame you players. I'm going to blame everything else. So forget about all that. Like, Joe, that can be, it can be a challenge, can't it? But when things go wrong, you need to keep that environment the same. It can, yeah, uh, Kieran. And you know, it's very, very easy to slip in back into kind of bad habits and move away from from the culture uh, because, as you say, it is a long term thing. And I, I can remember a few times, you know, yeah, particularly after games when we were maybe beaten, well beaten, didn't happen too often, uh, but um, that we kind of said, you know, will we do the reflection? Will we bother doing it? And then we kind of looked at each other and said, yes, we will, because <laughs> this is when you need the reflection. You know, when you get beat by 10 points, that's when you need it most, rather yeah. than, you know, you getting beat by one point or winning a game. So, yeah, I think, I think you have to stick to your guns, and you did stick to your guns uh, with, with regard to that. So I, I, think, I think it's important that uh, sometimes success can hide a lot of faults. So things aren't very good, they're not going very well. But you win a game and no one cares. You know, it doesn't matter that way. And I, I remember speaking to usually players on opposition teams and they'd be like quietly giving out to me about the coaching or the, the management or whatever. But yet we played them then two weeks later and they beat us. So like a bit of success and winning games, Ross, kind of hides those problems bubbling underneath. Of course it does. But I think we have to stand proud a little bit because... Listen, we didn't have too many successful days on, on match day. You know, if you look at the whole standard, we were very competitive and we set up a very good team. But London were historically used to not winning and not winning games. So we, especially in the first year, you know, we was overcoming losses, whether we were close or not. And we still done the right things, stuck to what we was good at, because that was what was going to maximise what we had with our players and, and our setup and our limited resources. So, like, we done really well. We could have easily gone back to gone back to base, it's gone back to old school, scrapped a lot of things, but you know, we stuck at it. And I think by year three, year four, we was really seeing the benefits of that in terms of the real competitive nature. And we were beating teams and teams were, you know, not didn't want to play us because we was at a good level where, you know, we could have we could have turned anyone over in the league, for example. So yeah, uh, we got to stand proud by that. Yeah. yeah. And I think I think Ross just sorry to cut across there, Karen. I think I think if you look at the league table after year three, I think that was a very successful year because Goal difference wise, I think we were in the positive care, and I can't, can't remember. Or it was, it was, it was certainly. I think with parity, actually, you know. Uh, so, so over the course of seven games in a league campaign, if a London team is is kind of equal in, in goal difference or scoring difference, then that's that's a big success because that success. measures the long term, the long term thing. It's a success, definitely. Okay, just uh, and uh, I think it's important when when we're chatting about our experience from London. 
it's not like we're wanting to reflect only back on that. We're, we're, we're trying to think, okay, well, the principles actually that can be applied to other teams, isn't it? These are the important things and everything. So on, on the planning and organizing, and Joe, you did ended up doing a lot of this. You know, at, you were like head of operations and stuff and coaching. And how important is that to the setup? Just having everything in place and planning, planned very well. And like with the thought that, modern GA counties are big operations, aren't they? Like professional football teams have full-time staff to take care of operations and everything like that. But in a GA team and a county, it's a pretty big thing, isn't it, oper- operations? Yeah, it is. And it was a steep learning curve for me, <laughs> uh, Kieran. Um, and, you know, if you, if with, with operations, you know, people out there are probably thinking, well, what, what does that mean, operations? You know, well, what do you do, you know? Um, there's just lots of different things that, that are done. I think one of the most important aspects of that particular role for me was uh, with the away trips. Mm-hmm. And uh, one season, I think, here, we had all of our games were away, seven games away. Uh, so, you know, one of the things I had to do was draw up a schedule for the weekend. And I had to make sure that the flight times were all correct, that the players were arriving to the airport, to the right airport, making sure they're not going to Terminal 3 rather than Terminal 2. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, making sure that they're all okay with their passes, um, you know, making sure, you know, liaising with you, liaising with Phil, the kit man, to make sure all the kit's there. Mm-hmm. Um, probably more important than that was the timings as well, making sure we're, we're at the ground at the right time, you know, uh, getting from the hotel to the ground before the games. A lot of our games were kind of two o'clock. Um, so, it, it, so you had to, there's a lot of research done on my behalf, Google Maps, finding out how long exactly it yeah. takes to get to the ground from, from the hotel. You know, and if you're 15 minutes too early, some of the players are walking around, they don't know what to do with themselves. Yeah. Yeah. That can have an impact on their performance on the field. If you're 15 yeah. minutes too late, people are running around, the physio's getting the, the table up, you know, yeah. people don't know what's going on. Uh, so you know, isn't it isn't it interesting, Joe, that when you're a player, you turn up with your boots. You, you, you like with a, with a county team, you don't turn up with your kit because the kit is all provided. You turn up with your boots. You're told be at this bus stop at ten o'clock in the morning, or be in this pitch or whatever, and you don't really give a shit, do you? You don't think about anything else. Whereas when you're involved in a staff, you have to go through all those details, and I think you. Like those are important things, aren't they? Yeah, they are. You know, and, and this is what you want. You want these things uh, sorted out because then the players don't have to worry about them. Because then all the players do is perform on the pitch and go through their own uh, rituals. So I certainly won't yeah. take for granted anyone who's who's kind of operations director. You kind of have to do it to military precision. And some yeah. of the things also, some of the things are out of your control here. Like for example, you know, if we're playing in a big city, perhaps Limerick. You have to take into consideration things like traffic. If you're yeah. playing in rural areas, maybe out in Derry, remember, remember yeah. we had to go through a few mountains in Derry to get to the <laughs> uh, The other thing you have to worry about are the, you know, the roads and not even knowing where the pitch is. The pitch doesn't even come up on, on Google. Yeah. So from that point of view, you know, it, it, it was quite challenging. You know, and it was, as I said, it was a steep, uh, it was a steep learning curve. Yeah, Ross. Uh, Kiers, just on yep. that, yeah, no, because it's, this is paramount to any setup, I think. Yeah. And, and you know, yeah. kudos to anyone who's doing this outside of their full time job as well, because yeah. some football clubs have got full time people to do this. You know, the, the, you guys are doing it, and everyone's doing it off the back of extra hours. But if you haven't got this stuff down, nailed down to the point, then forget about any detail of coaching, forget about anything, because the, the players will notice. I know they just turn up with their boots and they want to play, but yeah. if things aren't organised well and training's not organised and the match day itinerary's not organised, then they'll, not, they'll cop on and they won't be happy and it'll affect their performance. So th- that's the foundation for any successful um, setup is having this spot on. Absolutely. And, and, and on that call that I was on with some of the, the, the Irish S&C coaches and stuff, we discussed the other day about that of, like, you create an environment and everything like that, but People, players will buy into you if they see that you're competent. If they see that you're a good coach, you're a good manager, you've set up things well, you run things well. And like Joe was saying there, like the operations is such a big part of that. Because if you arrive late for the match and the player's rushing around, he doesn't give a damn then about your ILP that you did during the week or that brilliant drill or practice. Or he's like, oh, this is, I'm late, I'm not happy. And so like... 
all I would say is the club coaches or any coaches out there, get your operations right because you've control over that in some ways. You know, you can be well organized and plan things and everything. You don't have to be the best coach. You don't have to be, you know, a brilliant ex player or anything like that, but you just need to be to be organized. And the beauty, Joe, like those away trips for us, we're based in London and we're traveling back to Ireland on flights. Like those away trips, I think, were so important in building that bond and the culture and everything around it and the tactics for the team, weren't they? Absolutely, Kieran. And, you know, whilst it's sometimes challenging to go over there because you're getting up at maybe half four or five o'clock in the morning to, to get to an airport in East London, uh, you know, there are massive benefits, advantages of, of playing away from home because you can you can sort of relax when you're there in the hotel. You can sit down, you can get to speak to the players, get to know the players a bit better. You can even structure the whole day and you can have you can have yeah. good meetings. And the yeah. players don't mind if the meetings I know players in general don't like meetings, but if you if you're in a hotel and they're not going anywhere, they don't mind the meetings. Yeah. You know, if, if you're having a meeting after a training session, a lot of them want to get home, you know. Yeah. So from that point of view, there are a lot of advantages. And it means you can embed your kind of tactics. And that's where I think that we were quite strong, sort of tactically, in that situation. Yeah. So, yeah, it's very, very good. It's very, very, there are lots of good things about, about traveling back over to Ireland. Yeah. So. Do you know, Ross, on those weekends as well, like uh, one of our kind of values or like was, was player ownership. You know, or, or one of our objectives, I should say, is give ownership to the players. And they were great opportunities in those meetings of like putting stuff over to the players to get them to speak, to get them to come up with position essentials and IAPs and get their thoughts on the tactics. And as I always say, it's player led coach facilitated. So we facilitated those meetings, but they were the ones really who led them. Yeah, and some key culture, like um, long-term standing parts of the culture were, were mm. kind of created in those away trips early on um, yeah. and then revisited, you know, the key essen the positional essentials you did over, yeah. over a weekend away and, and different unit work, constant reflection, video analysis, use of the stuff we did there on opposition or individual or, or as London as a team. So they're, they're massively important to make that time um, like don't waste the time just letting players mm. go back to the room for four hours and watching yeah. telly. And it, you've got to make use of the time and get everyone together. And you, you, you know, we did a great job in making it player, player um, led or player ownership and stuff. Yeah. You know, in terms yeah. of because there's such a fine balance there, isn't there? You know, you need to yeah. give them the info, and we'll talk about that in terms of the the coaching stuff as well. You need to give them good info and need to coach yeah. them, but also it has to come from within, and they're in the game, they see it. So you know, yeah. then weekends are invaluable for for all parts of this yeah. culture. I think. Do you know I've been listening to to um the Eddie Eddie Jones Eddie Jones the the, the English uh, rugby coach his podcast and Ross I know you have uh, been also and it's it's brilliant really really interesting stuff now the one thing I'd say about it is that like loads of stuff he's saying and they're going you know uh, yeah we 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 did that like I I know that you know mm -hmm. um but one thing that really hit me and uh, it resonated with me a lot with what I thought was really interesting was about in meetings and everything and in preparation for the game three things three things only never go beyond three things because you know humans kind of like to jump on three things I'm going to I can remember three things if I go to four or five or six I'm not going to remember those things mm. and how he keeps his meetings and analysis like so short so small, little, short, bite-sized meeting with a few key points, and that's it. And I think from, from, from my personal development, I would probably shorten the meetings, or even I'd split them up. You know, that kind of way. I'd go like, you know what? Let's meet for 15 minutes about our attack and setup. Let's go and have a break for 10 minutes. Go and get a coffee, whatever. Come back for another 15 minutes. Uh, work, work on our defense or, or attack, whichever is the opposite. Three key things, and that's it. I think it's easy to fall into the trap of trying to give the players everything you know about the mm -hmm. game. And may maybe we were a little bit guilty of that, of trying to just get across so much info yeah. um, that then it's kind of like what lands and what doesn't land. So that's, I think that's, that's a huge reflection point there and maybe something going forward to, yeah. to even have less than three things, depending on the group you're working with. Yeah. London, London, yeah. 
Do you know what's interesting with that as well is, and Joe alluded to it, like you have players there who uh, have been there a number of years and then you have players who are coming in fresh. And I know every team has that, like has new players. But we, we had new players coming in who had no clue about how to set up as a defence or tactics or, you know, they were coming from just a small club team and they had never been exposed to something. Whereas if you look at... Joe, if you look at like Tyrone, you know, a young player is playing with the under 21s or minors into 21s and then in graduating into senior, he already knows a lot, a hell of a lot by the time he enters into the senior team. Yeah, he, he knows he knows how to how to play football. He knows in what way that particular county plays football. Yeah. So there's not really much to adapt to from that point of view. So, you know, then that's probably credit to some of the Lawton players there for being able to do yeah, it. Yeah. I think I think if you're if you come to in general, if you come to live in London, if you're an Irish lad, I think you're quite op- you'd be quite open anyway and you're quite open to to learning. Um so from that point of view I think yeah, it's, it's very important. Yeah. yeah. But but I was just going back to um to giving the players little chunks, you know, you talked about giving them fifteen minutes here and then, you know, letting them release and then give them 15 minutes later on that that was massively important um, without getting too technical there's a thing in education called cognitive overload and it was weird. Oh, Joe you're not going to bloody bore us with your education stuff now are you you give them too much information <laughs> <laughs> then they end up learning nothing uh, so so it was good to have those short snappy those short snappy meetings and then we yeah. meet them again and then you're retaining the information by going back to them again so yeah, that was all good in terms of the learning process, Kieran. Joe, that must be why uh, why schools do what six hours straight of, of lessons. <laughs> yeah, I, I give I give them a break, you know. Give them. A break. <laughs> yeah, I bet you do. I bet you do. <laughs> uh, okay, in, interesting. We move on, lads. And Ross, this kind of spans both areas really of the planning and organising, but then into the support staff. And I'd like to just kind of tap into your experience and knowledge uh, of being head of performance, uh, like a really big role, head of performance with QPR Academy. (laughs) And like, I suppose for you, let's say, forgetting about London thing, but for you with QPR and everything like that, and you're building a department and you have sports scientists, S&C, performance analysts, nutrition, psychology, like what are some of the important factors that you need to keep in mind when you're building such a department? I think um, I think the two, like just talking about the two different roles then that, that was on at the time with QPR and then obviously going into London. Yeah. And for me, they were very similar in a way because when I inherited QPR, uh, the role of QPR, I was in the, the, the you know QPR the sports scientist for a couple of years before that. But you know there was a lot of things I wanted to change, a lot of things that I wanted to change, not just not just the processes, but also people. You know, I, I felt like we needed a real freshen up, and and that's where I felt we was at the moment in time. But someone once said to me, they said, um, you know, Rome wasn't built overnight. And I used to think I, I was too eager to try and change everything, everything. I want this to be good, this to be good. And, you know, it's only now that I actually think, do you know what? I've got the department in a really, I'm three, three and a half years into the post now. And it's only now where I think I've got the department in a real good place. And, you know, I've, yeah. I, it's, taken, it's taken that long to change things. And it was the same for London. You know, it was mm-hmm. trial and error. It was... Yeah, and you know the fact that I had a manager that was so educated in sports science as well, and was kind of pushing me at times to introduce new initiatives when when I was one saying mm, I'm not sure. You know, we had a debate about psychology and and <laughs> stuff like that. You, it, it was good because it kind of kept me like trying to constantly improve. But we had to sometimes take a step back and go, well, we've improved this this year and it's worked really well. You know, and we'll run with that and we'll maximise that, and then in three or four months, yes, we're going to put this in and we're going to, instead of just keep it, like introducing new and new things and the effect of each thing doesn't, doesn't maximise per se. So that was a key yeah. thing for me. Yeah, it's a really interesting point, I think, isn't it? Because we all want, we all want something straight away and, and we want results and we want to introduce new ideas, but ultimately it's, uh, you, like Anthony Turner in Middlesex always used to say, soon, soon ripe, soon rotten. So if you get to somewhere really, really quick, well, it might, if things go badly, it might go the opposite direction really, really quick as well. And sometimes mm-hmm. that development over long term is best if you can, if you can afford that, I suppose. How, how did you find then, like moving on to the support staff, that, that that was the next point in the development process for us that I mentioned on the webinar? 
how did you find then managing the different people coming into the roles? Because I suppose because of the nature of us being in London with such little money and funding and people coming and going like from the city even, how did you find integrating those people into the setup, the different sports scientists, the interns, the, the nutrition, the psychology then? It, it was very tough because you're, you're, you're basing everything around like trying to be professional and, and trying to communicate and give the players the best service possible. And obviously we only had limited amount of time and, and staff only had limited amount of time outside of their other commitments. So, you know, we, the way we work, we're very full on, we're very professional. We want, yeah. we want a good service, you know, and, and Joe will vouch for that. He, he, he learned that straight away. Your WhatsApp messages are pinging all the time. And that's, that's the way we are. You know, a message comes in at 11 o'clock at night we nine times out of ten we're replying we're not waiting yeah. till the morning things yeah. th- th- that's just the way now we obviously respect the the work-life balance as well and that's that's probably something we we looked we looked at over time and maybe you know we needed to come off come off the gas a little bit yeah. but yeah i think i think hard work was anyone that come in with a real passion and hard work like fitted into the program and, and a willingness to open fit into the philosophy and become you know, an integral part of us moving forward. Um, yeah. So it, it was trial and error with different staff, trial and error. Yeah. And, and yeah. it wasn't perfect. It wasn't perfect at times, but you know, we did our best with the limited resources to, to really improve things and, and try to prepare these players as best we could. Yeah. Do you know something that I, I, I was always really interested in, and I think we got there by the end as well over time was I thought, okay, well, we don't have the resources or the players or the money or whatever or the history that Dublin or Mead or Kildare or all those teams or the, the mighty Wexford Joe have. So, but what do we have? What does London have? Well, it's as a city, it's young, it's creative, it's innovative, it's um, dynamic, it's interesting. So I kind of thought, that, okay, well, that's, what, that's who we are and that's what we want to be. And that included like the young London born players who had a little bit of swagger about them and stuff like that. Um, so we, I tried to kind of always dial into that feeling, Joe, a little bit, you know, and, and have a backroom team and a staff who are young and innovative and creative and, and get up and go. Yeah. And <clears throat> I think that's one of the benefits again of, you know, being in London. Uh, it's you you have access to lots of people who are well qualified people and there's a lot of competition as well for for um, you know those people actually want to come on board uh, because it gives them an opportunity too uh, but I think more important than that is um, is trying to find out most of the, most of them are hard working you know and that was part of the culture as well you know you, you work hard you, you put the hours in um, if it doesn't work out, that's fine. You know, just 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 try again. Yeah. Um, and certainly in London, just go back to your, you know, having creative, young, innovative people there um, from different backgrounds too, Kieran. You know, and you know, one of the things for me, just coming from a Gaelic GAA background, is is that I was able to learn from Ross there from the soccer background. I was able to learn from you know some of the psychologists or some of the others who were helping the coaches. Um, so rugby, you know, we'd, we'd rugby people in too. So, so from that point of view, it was not just good for the people we were bringing in. It was good for, for us who were steeped in the GAA background. Yeah. So, yeah, it helps everyone, you know, the, the, the different types of people coming in. Yeah, definitely. Do you know what I always felt? It always annoyed me when I saw managers picking a coach because he's his buddy and picking a physio because he knows, if, you know, his dad's brother, whatever. I, I always felt it's not even about getting the best group of people together. It's often about specific people for specific roles. So I had people in the setup at times who, for instance, maybe not a good coach, but is really, really good, you know, maybe, I don't know, on analysis or someone else who's like, um, doesn't read the game well, but he's brilliant at organizing stuff. Or and, and look, these are hypothetical <laughs> examples, actually. But do you know what I mean? That you you want somebody like kind of who's hot on analysis and like who knows opposition players and teams and stuff. Because it meant that well, I didn't have to troll through hours and hours and hours of watching them. Like I had somebody dipping into that, and then somebody else is a brilliant coach. So great, that person can coach, and another person then is maybe like just takes a slightly 
background kind of uh, place and, and a view and kind of kind of oversee a few things and just can chip in and go, do you know what, actually, you could try that. You know, so Joe, it's quite interesting to have different characters, I think, involved. <clears throat> yeah, and it's uh, tapping into that expertise. It's probably better in any organization to, to have experts in different fields rather than have having generalists yeah. uh, because they, they know their own field. They, they need to know more than you about the subject that, they're, that, they're, that their role is on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so from, from that point of view is important. And also, I think you outsourced a lot, <clears throat> a lot of the analysis to, uh, to, you know, to people in Ireland as well. Yeah. And you were able to do that remotely, and that and that helped too. You know, there were lots of guys who we were working with who we physically didn't, <laughs> we physically hadn't met, which is you know a sign of the times, obviously. Yeah. Uh, with, the, with the technology, but but yeah. that was great too, and that was another source that was used. Yeah, and then yeah, as you as you say, you know, you need to get the balance right. You can't have everyone who is an expert in one particular field. You need people who kind of know a little bit about everything, mm -hmm. as well, because they can take they can stand back. Yeah. They can overlook it and they can maybe see things. They can link things up, I think. Yeah. Little. I think it, it is important that people understand sport as well and understand football. You know, that no matter whether they're an analyst, sports science, coach, obviously, a physio, you need someone who has some experience or knowledge of sport and all the better if it can, of your sport. And I, I am a believer in that. Ross, here's one for you. How do you get the balance right between your backroom staff uh, buying into the manager's philosophy or the philosophy of the club versus your backroom staff being critical and questioning things? Um, <laughs> you have people in you can trust. The problem is, Kiz, is, you know, listen, looking back at it, we, uh, you'll be the first one to say, you didn't get support staff. 100% right every year. You know, it's hard. You're trying to recruit so many people. I think the best year we had, unfortunately for us, was the last year. You know, when you, we had, a, I think, a, the best dynamic among staff. And I think everyone was kind of singing the exact same hymn page because people have different views on things and people come in with different ideas. And that's, that's normal. Of course it is. Yeah. And like I said, the hardest thing is to get everybody on the same page um, to be yeah. working towards something. So it doesn't matter how how someone is it really if someone off a different hymn sheet or going against the manager or the philosophy it's not going to work so you need people in you can trust people that you can that you know are going to deliver your philosophy your values um how you'd like to run things and that's how an organization grows yeah i think it, it, it's joe yeah yeah I, I agree yeah i'd certainly agree with that ross um i think you know um you can disagree with the manager you know, that's fine to disagree with the manager. But at the end of the day, it's the, it's the manager who, ha, who makes the final decision on players. You know, Kieran, I'm sure there were lots of times where I disagreed with you on player selection. What? <laughs> or, 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 or whatever, we had a discussion about it. But, but at the end of the day, most of the time, um, at, the end of the day, at the end of the day, if the manager makes the decision, you have to go, you have to go along with that. You cannot be going behind the manager's back and saying to the players, well, it wasn't my decision that you're not the team. Yeah. Because once you, once you do that, then that's the worst thing that can happen. That's a toxic culture and it leads, it leads to bad performance and it leads to bad results. And you can't have that type of stuff. And um, I thought that was one of our, our strong points, you know, that yeah. we were able to go along with any decisions that were made. Yeah, I think so it's that's a great point, though. That's a great point, though, Keir. Sorry that maybe I didn't get across so well. I think the culture was very open, you know, and, and you know, we always had debates, even amongst the three of us and other staff, good, healthy debates on players, on training, on et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, once the decision was made and whether that was unanimous or it came down to the manager putting his neck on the line for something, then that's the decision that you stick by. And there's no other whispering behind, so I don't agree with that, or, you know, whispers getting to the players that that's not the right yeah it can create problems can't it and, and I always try to tell the backroom team that whether you agree with it or not and you, we can have our discussion and you can get your point across that if a decision is made then we have to be united with that and you have to approach the players as a united front because if you disagree and you're then chatting to a club mate of yours or you know, on the quiet and saying, well, actually, I didn't agree with that. It's a toxic relationship then. 
because there's a splintering of the staff and like at, unfortunately at times we 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 had that you know but i think it's very important that you you really be mindful of that and like something i used to say is that and ross chris ramsey who we had on the podcast said it the first day he came into qpr he said i know you have a philosophy and i'm not saying it, my philosophy is right but this is the philosophy we're going to follow whether you think it's right or not, I'm not saying it's the best, but it's the one that we're going to follow and we're all going to buy into that. Yeah, I mean, I think Chris put it on the podcast. He had, he's got a FIFO uh, policy, so <laughs> you either fit in or you, or you go, Joe. Um, that's, that's not what the FO stands for. But, you know, listen, I mean, I, I, that, that's the way that his experience did himself. He, he wants to do it a certain way and that's how he feels is the best and, and you need to jump on board with that. And of course, there's ways of improving it and, and making it innovative and rolling with the times, but it, that, that's the set philosophy. And unfortunately, yeah. if you want to roll with philosophy, you can't be involved. Um, yeah, and, and do, do, do you know what I was to say as well is that obviously, like somebody else will get their turn. You know, that somebody else will take over as manager or whatever. And then when they get their chance, they can do their philosophy. And like in fairness, Michael Maher, who, who we brought in in our final year, like Michael was brilliant. You know, he was a brilliant coach and everything like that. And uh, Michael then has taken over after us. And, and he has his opportunity then to like follow through on what he wants to do. So that's how things work. You know, just a reminder to everybody, head over onto the website, dailysportscience.com. We're running 20% off. Barry Milan has come on board with her new hurling coach and he's uh, put up loads of practices for hurling specifically, which are brilliant. Joe Coulter then is doing some tactical pad uh, session plans. Joe, they've got a really good response online and things have gone really well. And, and also you designed a return to GA theoretical model that if the GA returns, what are some of the practices and drills that coaches can do with the players? Yeah, Kieran. Um, it's a kind of a five-step phase drill, if you like, and it kind of uh, it links or coincides with the Irish government's approach to uh, returning back to normal. Uh, so I've got a I've got a few uh, practices off it up there on the website. Uh, so yeah, I just go on to the website. The other thing is the uh, the other uh, sessions that I have are of kind of Tyrone. What a typical training session may have looked like. With Tyrone, with Di with Dublin in 2019, Tyrone 2003. So yeah, so quite interesting there. Bloody goal! Have a look. Yeah, it looks it looks really really cool actually, really great. Ross, you've changed your background. You've shifted into the other room. You're looking after your little man going to bed. Yeah, little man's got bedtime, and uh, we're we're moving, so we've got no desk, no table at the minute. So there's there's loads of boxes in the background. So make, make sure make sure in London the doors are locked. That's for sure. <laughs> okay, so what we'll do is we'll finish up on the last point, the, the sixth step of that model of development, which is reflection, for part two of the podcast. Uh, later in the week or next week, we'll release it. We'll move on to sports science innovation and individualized coaching because we just felt that there's so much there to talk about you could cover it you could fill a whole podcast on its own Ross just on those points wasn't it yeah yeah that, it kind of wanted to break it into two an overall reflection and kind of how we set things up from a culture perspective and even interactive with each other and different staff and players but then also the real detail coming off the back of both obviously Bernard and Chris's podcast um, the detail of the coaching and what we implemented there so yeah brilliant okay cool all right so we'll go into the the reflection part i suppose the main point of this when i was doing the ga webinar was how brutally honest we were in in terms of our reflection so i like getting feedback it hurts sometimes when the feedback is not good but i want to hear it because joe my, my philosophy is like just just say it straight out and give me exactly what's not going well or what wasn't good enough or whatever and that's how I learn and I want to get that feedback yeah um and I think it's it's important to uh not only get sort of reflect on your own performance but maybe to get other people to kind of reflect upon it uh, because there might be some things that you that you not you personally but that we yeah. all might miss you know um you know could be when how we speak to players, it could be you know um, setting up the session, planning the session. It could be implementing the session. 
you know, did things go right? You can kind of look at that yourself and, and reflect, you know, maybe on the car on the way home, you might say, you know, did, did I do that part of the training session well? Did I say that to that player at the right time? You know, you always do that to yourself sort of coming home, but, but you also like to have other people coming up uh, to you and, and, and kind of telling you, or not telling you, but maybe asking you how you could have done it better. So, yeah, so it's very important, uh, the reflection part. And it, it kind of taps into that concept at the beginning we spoke about player ownership and also that kind of openness of creating an environment of learning and openness and reflection and improvement and that everybody come in, comes into this culture and environment where they go, okay, well, I'm actually open to giving feedback and also I'm open to put my hand up and say, well, you know what, I don't agree with that and you're not just going to get shut down. Ross, it's interesting because working in professional football, especially first team level, for instance, like the manager at first team level is not going to listen to much feedback from the players, is he, in, in general? In general, and it's very uh, stereotypical now of, of what soccer is like. But I said it a couple of times, even with Berners' podcast, rugby, I think, is ahead of the curve in terms of yeah. player ownership. I think they give so much ownership to the players. Now, this is not saying either one's right. This is just yeah. how my take on things. GAA and Gaelic football, I think, is then slightly behind rugby and, and in general. But football is very much what the manager says goes. And if, if the players don't perform on the big day, I don't think the, man, the manager might internally take some slack. But he's not telling that to the players, you know. He's, the players haven't performed for him. And, and that's kind of how it goes. Whereas in other sports, there's maybe more reflection on, on the management process. But that was a really interesting one that we all internalised and spoke about. You know, at times we felt the players didn't perform the best that they could have and we felt preparation was right but then listen to Eddie Jones podcast you know the manager essentially no matter what happens with the players it's down to the manager because if, yeah. they, if they haven't performed on the big day why haven't they what reasons haven't they performed on the big day uh, is it historical are they used to not performing on big days and, and getting results is it is it the way you prepared so there's all them questions that you're talking about all the time but the cult the culture you set up at, at london and the way you work in general and the way we are in the academy and stuff is is very open and looking for improvement all the time uh, feedback i know you did the match uh, feedback forms on how you felt things go and set up so that, that's definitely the way forward but i don't think it, it can be a hundred percent player owned you know at some sometimes players have to be told and like if you're looking for a quick fix you can't let a player figure something out because you need to tell him that he needs to mark this man or the space that's the that, that's the danger of the space or whatever it is so there's a balance there yeah there's a real balance there isn't there of of listening to a player and being open to that but also ultimately decisions have to be made in that moment and like players are selfish aren't they they, they want to play they want to play the full game and I suppose they will get blinded some more than others about their own game. They may, might want the team playing in a specific way because they feel they'll get the best out of themselves. Whereas you as a manager or us as coaches have to think of the, the overall team and the, 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 the greater good, isn't it? Joe, are there, are there situations where you can give too much ownership over onto players and be too open to feedback? Um, yes, the, the answer to that is yes. There are situations where that can happen, where you can give too much ownership, uh, especially in areas where the players themselves <clears throat> don't have enough knowledge or don't have enough expertise. Uh, you can't really outsource that type of ownership to the players yeah. because, you know, as you say as well, there, there are also players are kind of selfish in that way and they, they want to get in the first 15. You know, and they might say things to you as a management, which might help them to get on the team. Yeah. You know, um, I'm not saying in a vindictive type of way because we all want to start on football teams. So, yeah, I think, you know, you have to get the balance right. So, you know, just going back to your questions, your question, sorry. Um, I think there are things that you can kind of outsource. So, for example, kind of the reflection we don't after the games if you're getting information back from all of the players that, is, that are some common threads that all the, the players believe, mm. then sometimes, if you think you're wrong, sometimes you might have to go with that. You might have to listen to that because it's common from all of them. It's not just some outlier, one player that's saying it. It's, it's all of them. So from that point of view, if you're getting feedback back that's kind of team-based, it's it's good that way but no i i i think sometimes we can have too much ownership 
over to the players. Yeah. Roth, do you know what I found difficult always was when you lose a game, when you, when you know that you're good enough and you expect to win, and dealing with the frustration of that loss versus looking forward to the next game. So how much that you come down hard on the players afterwards and tell them, listen, that is not good enough. We expect more from you in that. You're better than that versus not putting people's noses out of joint and being able to kind of to park it and go, okay, I'm really unhappy with that performance, but it's finished, it's gone, and let's just move on to the next game. And that balance is so hard to, to get right. Very, very tricky. Very tricky. And just going back to your point, Joe, on there, like I, I agree with that in terms of if someone's putting feedback on the, the shape we weren't set up right or, you know, the forward line weren't set in the right way to get enough points and scores and stuff. Like, that's where you hold every player to account in terms of their job essentials, in terms of their job roles. So if someone's done all of their job roles individually, yet the team hasn't been successful, he's got a right to then say, well, either that individual didn't do their job or the setup wasn't right. Mm. But if he didn't, then, or she didn't, then you can't talk about anyone else because that's why you have that reflection model on yourself. So that, that was really important that we tried to bring in that self-reflection on your performance. And I think it worked really well. Um, in terms of that period after the game is very, very, very hard. You know, you, you have to get it right. You have to make sure that people know the performance wasn't good enough and we start reflecting on that. And, yeah. you know, Bernard Jackman calls it the post-mortem and, and we get that done ASAP. And then even like the Tuesday night was the first kind of team session back during the week. So that was the gym session where you was there sometimes. Yeah. More, often, more often than not, kids, to be honest, in the gym yeah. session and having individual meetings, the mood has to change by that Tuesday because yeah. that's the turning point where we're going to switch to the next weekend. So you've got Monday to internalize it and do your clips and have a think yeah. about it after what you've said. And then Tuesday, switch on again, it's ready to go. Yeah, you know, it's, you, uh, you make some really good points there. I've been watching Pep Guardiola's Man City uh, documentary on, on um, Amazon Prime. And it, it, it's very interesting. And I remember after one game where they were beaten by Man United, they, were, they had a chance to win the league in Old Trafford in the enemy's territory against Manchester United. And they blew it. They went 2-0 up, lost 3-2 in the second half. Paul Bogba scored two goals and whoever got the winner. And Fabian Delph, after the game, you could see he was hyped. His emotions were running high. He was unhappy. He was shouting. He was giving out to other players. He was blaming everything. And Guardiola was like, no, 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 no. This is not the time for this. You know, this is not the time for the post-mortem. All you do here." is you be disappointed, uh, you, get, you get changed, you get out of here, you look after your recovery, and there'll be another time for that post-mortem. And, you know, I, I, it was really interesting because I, I taught that, like, even after, straight after the game, in the dressing room or on the pitch, sometimes you'd have a meeting, just a debrief of the game. And you know what? Sometimes you're better off kind of going, like, saying very little, saying very little, really, because if you are disappointed in them or in the, the result, like they know that you don't really need to say it out, and in ways by you saying nothing or saying very little, you, you it's probably even more powerful. Joe, what do you reckon? Yeah, um, that just reminds me, Kieran, going back to um, I think it was our first game of the season. It was against uh, Waterford in Waterford, and it, we we thought we were going to go in and have a really good performance. Uh, but they hammered us. I think they beat us by about eleven or twelve points. And I remember in the changing rooms. After the game, you know, it was a big defeat. You know, we weren't really mm -hmm. expecting to beat that by that much, and um, and we didn't really say that much. You know, you didn't really say that much because it kind of gave us time to kind of formulate our thoughts on the plane on the way back, and you know, to make sure that if we're given feedback, it has to be clear. It has to be kind of planned feedback too. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't just go in and say you done that wrong, you done this wrong. So so it gave us time to reflect, if you like, and get information back of the players before we went in and hit them with everything. So I think on that Monday or Tuesday night, we had training again. And, and, you know, the trainings on the Monday and Tuesday night, they're not really tough sessions, you know, because you, you wanted a maybe six or seven RPE. But, um, but, we, um, but we worked them really hard that night and we done analysis. <laughs> you remember that? And we worked them and it must have been a nine yeah. in terms of yeah. tough as that training session. So a couple of things went out the window, but it was the right thing to do at the right time. And if you remember also, Kieran, the... The week after that, we went and played Carlo, yeah. and we put in an excellent performance, and we we beat um, we beat Carlo. Yeah. Uh, so, 
one so, of our best ever performances, I think, Joe. Yeah, from that point, from that point of view, Kier, yeah. you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes a you can't go in, uh, start roaring and shouting at them, and also um, b sometimes you have to move away from the plan slightly, mm. not too much, you know, still stay within the framework of everything, but sometimes you have to adjust and get the yeah. performance. I think that's a brilliant point because in ways there's not a formula. You you can't say that just remain silent after the game with disappointment and then hammer them on the Tuesday night or be positive after the game and wrap your arm around them on the Tuesday night. You you, you have to feel the, or you, you need to tap into the feeling, don't you? And you, you need to kind of go with your gut feeling and go, do you know what they need now? Like sometimes they do need a bollocking. Sometimes you need to kind of say, look, that that's not good enough. But you might turn up like Ross, you were saying, you might turn up on Tuesday night then and you go, right, bang, let's go. We're, we're ready to go. Forget about that game. It's gone. We won't worry about it. And let's just move on. Yeah, like you say, there's so many different ways you can do it. And it's so contextual and dependent on the group of players. Sometimes they're expecting a bollock in, but actually then you're not emotional in the way you deliver it. So you can deliver it a couple of really good key points of why we lost that game or why we didn't play very well. If you're emotional going into that debrief, you're not really going to give them very concise info, like Joe said. So it's about assessing the situation and making sure anything you give back to them is going to have a big impact, whether that's an improvement in tactical, technical performance, or whether it is just a kick up the arse. Um, yeah. and, and actually, they needed to work harder and application was poor. And, but you need to make sure the info is right. In whatever you're delivering, it's not just something you're saying for the sake of saying it. It's correct info. Yeah, and I think for any coaches out there, managers out there, let me tell you why it's so important. And I think we'll finish on this and we'll move on to part two next week. In our last season, when we were beaten by, we beat Wexford in the league, brilliant performance. We felt, right, we can go on and win two to three league games, which will, you know, give us another two-year kind of contract or agreement. And we were beaten by Waterford, Joe, if you remember, in Ricelip in a very, very poor performance where we expected, everyone expected us to win that game. And after the game, I couldn't hide my disappointment. And when we got to the, the gym on the Tuesday night, I still couldn't hide my disappointment. And I think that probably spooked some of the players, just how down we were about that performance. And we went into the game that weekend against Wicklow, a game that we, you know, we would have expected that we could win, and we lost it. And so instead of us finishing that league campaign with three wins, we finished it with one. And probably that week, I would say, you know, may have kind of cost us our positions with London, I would say. Yeah. And um, as Ross said, it's all to do with the context. And that Waterford game in Ricelip, if you remember, Waterford, I think, only came over with 18 players. So I think they only had three subs. Uh, and we were up by, I think it was seven or eight points in the first half. And then in the second half, I don't know if it was complacency. It must have been. Uh, in the second half, we, we went out and we tried to moved away from the script, I think. Uh, players try to do things that they shouldn't do. Um, you know, I don't know, maybe slightly, maybe we were a bit complacent going out at seven points up on rice lip. Does that happen yeah. a lot? Maybe, yeah, maybe yeah. not. Maybe we as coaches can be looked at too. Well, that's the first thing you look at is yourself. But yeah, but yeah the, the context is very, very important. If we hadn't won that game, you know, we probably would have won another one. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, well, look, that just shows the importance of actually getting that right, that message. It's difficult, it's a hard one, but but it's an important one. Lads, we might leave it at that for today. I think that, that was really interesting, really interesting to reflect back on stuff. What we'll do for the next day is we'll do a deep dive into the coaching, the individualised coaching um, the IAP work and then some of Ross, some of the sports science and the innovative kind of sports science stuff that we did and why we did it, for what reason, how we planned out and that should be an interesting chat as well I think. Yeah I'm looking forward to that one, that's, 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 that's my passion, that's my lover, the, the, <laughs> the coaching, the individual plans, um, you know what we did with those players on the pitch and, and different things around it so for sure that, that I'm looking forward to that. Okay, Brill. Okay, Joe, Ross, thanks very much. Remember, uh, people who are listening hit, listening in, go over to the website, dailysportscience.com. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook as well and um, get involved in the conversation. Okay, thanks, guys. Thanks.
Thanks. Thanks, Kieran. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Cheers.